Good day, everyone. Um, welcome to Talks at Google. Today's talk is going to be one that I feel that folks will find extremely interesting. Um, and we've got the author here, Nick Lane. So my name is Eric Smith, and I'll be your moderator for today's call. And uh, I just want to remind you, as we're going through the call, um, there is going to be an opportunity for you to add comments to um, comments and questions so that uh, Nick and I will have the opportunity to field those questions at the end of the call. You know, depending upon how much time we spend, <clears throat> how much time we have, you know, we might not get to all of them, but uh, we will facilitate uh, trying to get to all of them as most as, as best as we can. So um, Nick Lane. Um, Nick is a London-based biochemist, uh, professor, and an author. And that's why we're here today, is to talk about talk about his latest book, The Transformer. Transformer. And also, just to let you know, there is going to be the opportunity for anyone who'd like to uh, purchase a copy of this book. The link is uh, in the, in the uh, details for this meeting as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and bring Nick in. Nick, welcome to the call. Hi, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you. So I know you're joining us all the way from uh, London there. I'm uh, here in the States, but uh, mm -hmm. kind of great things we can do with technology these days. <laughs> so um, instead of us having to be side by side, we can be side by side on screen and still get the same things accomplished. So um, Nick, I was reading your book, um, had the opportunity to read it over you know, the uh, holiday weekend here. And uh, Krebs Cycle. Krebs cycle comes up, uh, and it seems to be a, a pretty big, uh, pretty big piece of uh, the book. You want to explain to individuals who aren't familiar with that what the Krebs cycle is? Ah, yeah. Um, so it's probably, probably on the face of it, a really stupid thing to write a book about because it's a piece of abstruse biochemistry that uh, anybody who does a degree, for example, in biochemistry or biology and things like that, or there are a lot of people learning at school in the UK. I don't know if you do it at the school in, in, in the US, but um, yeah. it's, um, it's kind of hardcore biochemistry and it's linked to uh, how respiration works, how we get our energy. And, and that's how it's taught. And that's what we kind of know about. Um, and, and it's become almost a watchword for complete tedium. Uh, people hate it. Uh, and, you know, pe people go through university and the one thing they can remember is how much they hate the Krebs cycle. And that it, you know, so my own my own research is 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 kind of I've got two ends of it. One one is about the origin of life and the other one is is about how mitochondria work, which are the energy um, kind of power packs in cells. And both ends of this research have ended up focusing on Krebs cycle. Uh, and, and I've been trying to put it together. How, how do they link up? Because it seems like a million miles away, the origin of life on one hand and cancer and aging and things on the other hand. Um, and they do join up and they join up in a very weird way because the Krebs cycle is not only about generating energy. It's effectively what it's doing really is it, it's pulling, it's taking, it's taking molecules, sugars like glucose, for example, and it's stripping them down and it's stripping out waste products and those waste products are carbon dioxide which we breathe out and hydrogen we burn the hydrogen and oxygen and that's where we get all the energy to live from but it turns out we've known about this since the 60s but it, a lot of people never heard of it is a thing called the reverse krebs cycle it does exactly the opposite it takes hydrogen it can bubble out of the ground you know you know in a, in a hydrothermal vent or something like that and co2 and it reacts them together to make organic molecules the the, the building blocks of life um and, and, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is what's going on at the origin of life. You've got a reaction between gases like hydrogen and CO2 to make these carbon-based um, molecules that are the, the, the kind of the building blocks of, of cells. Uh, and, and so it's, although it seems incredibly abstruse, this, this, this hardcore biochemistry, it really is a kind of explanation that underpins all of life. Great, great. And as you were mentioning, um folks might uh, leave university and feel that was one of their worst experiences going having to take this having to take the course in which this is discussed in still and yet it is like you said very interesting as to what <laughs> needs to take place um for life to happen um you start off talking about life itself yeah and give our listeners or our viewers an opportunity to understand a little bit more about uh when you talk about life itself um so I, 
as, as um, I suppose going back to the 1950s and onwards, uh, with the discovery of DNA and the double helix and the genetic code, information became really central to biology. And then with the advent of gene sequencing and genome sequencing and so on, biology has ended up in a place where it's kind of all about information. Uh, and, and we feel as if we, if we sequence a whole genome, um, then we'll know everything there is to know about how cells work. And, we, and actually, that's very far from the truth. I mean, there's, obviously, genes are important. I'm not trying to knock genes in some way. Um, but, but if you go back to before the 50s, back to the, the kind of the golden age of biochemistry, as it was, which seems like dusty textbook biochemistry now, um, people were thinking about dynamic processes. And that kind of thinking is beginning to come back. What is it about all the movement that's going on in cells? And cells, you know, they, they crawl around, they do things, and, and we are animated. And all of that animation is about energy flow. And we tend to assume, we've kind of been indoctrinated in this energy first view that energy is, you know, explains everything. And actually, the more you look into questions like the origin of life, the more you realize that there are dynamical systems that exist, like hydrothermal vents, which are you know continuous flow, continuous reactions, you could say continuous growth. Um, and it's that kind of environment that brings genes themselves into existence. So mm. we have in cells, we, we tend to think of metabolism on the one hand, all this chemistry that's going on in cells, and then the genetic information. And we tend to think the genetic information um, explains all of the metabolism, uh, but there's quite a strong argument to say it's really, it's the other way around, that the metabolism comes first and is quite spontaneous, uh, and it shapes the, the emergence of genes and the emergence of genetic information and what they can do from the very beginning. Wow. Well, and you are correct. I guess, you know, even in my thought process, I would think that the metabolism would come, come after, but basically, based on your research, you've learned that the metabolism is... Um, I mean, I have to say that's fairly controversial still, but it's becoming the work over the last 10 years on the origin of life has made it fairly clear that the metabolism looks like it's spontaneous. This chemistry really just happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I appreciate you uh, putting that in there. I know that, uh, you know, one of the things when I was reading the book and, you know, sometimes what I end up doing, I go to the back and I um, try to see who is validating the points and who's invalidating the points. And I, I, I love the way that you said that, you know, especially in your acknowledgement where you gave certain captors to individuals to have them read and, and check you. So um, no doubt, no doubt the information which you've included in the book is based on, you know, the information which you know to be, be correct. So I appreciate I mean, that. I've done my best. We all have a bias with these things. And actually to be, to be fair, you know, if you want to write a book and you want it to be accessible and intelligible to people, you have to tell a story. And that story inevitably means you, you know, you, you, you're going to miss out stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's a responsibility with telling a story as well, and uh, which is to acknowledge where you miss out stuff. Acknowledge mm -hmm. that now you're going to, uh, you know, tell 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 it from your point of view. It, it might be like this. It might be some other way as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But you you know, nobody's going to read a book that uh, <laughs> kind of explains every possible way of seeing the problem. No, and as you mentioned, everyone's going to have their opinions, and basically we we go by what we know. And um, Speaking of what we know, I guess when we talk about the path of carbon, and then I noticed there was uh, one section of that uh, chapter where you talk about the advent of radioisotopes. And, mm. you know, that kind of brings me back as well. Tell me a little bit more about uh, uh, your thoughts on the ad advent of radioisotopes. Yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting historical story that I was vaguely familiar with, uh, but I, I dug around in it a lot. And, you know, Oppenheimer comes up in there and Lawrence, anybody who's seen the movie, yeah. Um, it, we're, it, we're, we're in the Rad Lab in Berkeley in the 1930s, um, and it's um, it, it it was kind of slightly crazy because the, the theoretical physics was not quite able to keep up with the experimental work that was going on at the time. There was a hint of that in the movie as well, but um, and, and 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 there were a couple of characters who were really chemists in a physics lab, and they were trying to um, to isolate carbon isotopes, radioactive carbon isotopes. And the first one that they came up with um, was, was carbon-11, and it's got a half-life of about 20 minutes or something, which means you know every 20 minutes you've got half as much left. And so after a couple of hours, there's really it's undetectable levels. So they had these crazy experiments where they were trying to shoehorn everything into a two-hour window, sometimes in the middle of the night when they were able to, uh, to get access to the, to the reactors and so on. 
Um, and so it's a really interesting history um, and, and quite a, a, a sad history as well. And, and it goes into, uh, into the Second World War and it goes into um, uh, you know, isolating radioisotopes, goes straight into, uh, in, in, into uh, nuclear power and so on as well. And the bomb. Wow. Hmm. Okay. And then we go into gases, the gases to life. And then I guess, you know, uh, there was a section I was reading, you know, of course, I'm not that old, but still net when I saw that section, <laughs> when it said old is, how old is old? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of makes you, you know, um, so yeah. talk about how old is old, I guess. Uh, I guess that's part of the, part of the process as well as being able to determine um, utilizing the uh, tools and what you have at your, um, the tools you have in order to determine hold it is, but I'll let you explain that. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's just difficult for humans to um, get any kind of handle on the scale of time, uh, deep time in biology and geology. It's even worse in physics, but uh, if, we, if we're thinking about, you know, ancient processes, uh, <laughs> How old is old? Does an ancient process mean that it's, it's from the time of the dinosaurs, 65 million years or 200 million years ago? Or is mm -hmm. it from the, 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 the emergence of animals, which is around 550 million years ago? Um, or are we going back to the emergence of complex cells, which was maybe 2 billion years ago, or, or, or then right back to the origins of life, where we're close on 4 billion years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you know it's hard to tell if something's three and a half billion years old is that a big difference to four billion years old but in fact it can be a critical difference because it's it's kind of what came first it's the ordering of things and so how old is old is it's really a reference to well what comes first and the Krebs cycle it's definitely old it definitely goes back at least three and a half billion years but does it go back that little further does it go back to the origin of life is it really is it really, really old in terms of antiquity of life itself? Was it linked with the origin of life? So they're really difficult questions to get a handle on. Um, they're they're dif difficult experimentally. They're, there's no fossils really from that time. It's really difficult to try and work out a, a, a kind of a molecular clock for for life because normally you you have a you calibrate it according to fossils, but we don't really have very many fossils that we can recognize before about 2 billion years ago. So you've, <laughs> half the age of the planet, we've got no calibration points. So it's tricky and it's interesting. Um, and, and, you know, I don't resolve it. I don't pretend to resolve it, but uh, it's surprising how far you can go to, 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 to use the, the limited information we have to come up with answers that m make sense at least and are testable in the lab um, and, and that we can use as a kind of a foothold to, to, to explore these questions. To validate. So, you know, you, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. you have to have something, you know, uh, to validate in order to uh, compare against and get that baseline. Um, revolutions. Um, I, I liked that chapter because of the fact when you started off, you were not completely spineless. That kind of sucks you in. <laughs> You're not completely Good. spineless. So, you know, you know that uh, you've got some backbone. Tell us about that. Uh, so that's really a, a reference to a book that uh, made a big impression on me when I was about 16 or something, which was Stephen Jay Gould wrote a book called Wonderful Life. Uh, and it was about the, the Burgess Shale and the Cambrian explosion. Um, so the Cambrian explosion is, is a fairly abrupt appearance of animals in the fossil record. Um, and, and it's really in the space of a few million years, practically, you go from no fossils of animals to, you know, lots of phyla of different, dif different, different uh, animal groups. Um, and among those groups uh, are the chordates, which go on to become the vertebrates, or at least that includes the group that are the vertebrates, which are our own ancestors. Um, and, and, and Stephen Jay Gould made a big thing about this tiny little kind of, um, I suppose, a worm-like thing in the fossil record, but it had a, a, a clear vertebral column. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so uh, it, it, this was our ancestor. And, it, you know, there's all these amazing monsters and beasts from that period. And you can think, how did this little worm <laughs> survive yeah. and, 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 and get through? So, so, so that was what I was hanging that on, really. Mm -hmm. um, but... The question, the interesting question that I, I was driving towards was, well, what we're really seeing in the Cambrian explosion, we're, we're seeing animals with, with armor plating and with claws and with teeth. Uh, you know, <laughs> this, this is plainly predators and prey. 
Um, and we're seeing predation in the world for the first time. And, and that, you know, starts to beg some questions about, well, what do you need? You, you know, you physically crawl around, you physically do things. Um, and, and what does that take in terms of energy flow? Well, everything that we know now that is capable of crawling around and doing things and hunting and so on uh, requires oxygen and requires a complete Krebs cycle as we know it. And so you can hook it into the biochemistry. Um, and, and, and that effectively, the, you know, the interesting question is if for the first two, three billion years of life on Earth, the Krebs cycle was basically happening in environments where there was no oxygen where it was basically about growth. It was really about sucking in hydrogen and CO2 and making organic molecules to grow. Uh, and then sometime before the, or around the time of the Cambrian explosion, oxygen levels go up in the atmosphere. And when we start seeing predators and prey and things that uh, almost certainly have a Krebs cycle that's spinning in exactly the opposite direction. And now it's, 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 it's burning hydrogen in oxygen. Um, so what happened? Do you have a kind of a screeching to a halt of this reverse Krebs cycle and it turns and up goes in the opposite direction? It's not mm -hmm. as dramatic as that, but it's that's kind of the framing of it that I have in my mind is there's, there's this turning point, almost literally a turning point where the Krebs cycle screeches to a halt and goes in the opposite direction. And it's that that gives us the the you know the the the, the superpowering that allows us to be running around and really being being animals. Oh. Okay. Okay. And um, there's the, uh, the dark side and uh, where you talk about the uh, dream of a cell. And I know there's another portion of it where you talk about the uh, uh, rewiring of uh, metabolism. But uh, let's talk about the dream of a cell um, that's uh, in that section called the dark side. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a phrase from Francois Jacob, who said the dream of, uh, of, of every cell is to become two cells. Um, and, and the idea, you know, this, this is kind of the problem with cancer. Um, and it's one of the interesting things about multicellular organisms is we know when to stop. You know, we, 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 we are something in the order of 50 trillion cells. Um, but for most of us, for most of our lives, we kind of stop. We, 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 we don't just get cancer spontaneously. Um, but, but cancers revert to this, this dream of cells to become two cells and to, to, to grow. And, and the, you know, I was talking about which direction is the Krebs cycle going in. Um, all of these bacteria going back to the origin of life that are using the Krebs cycle effectively for growth, for biosynthesis, they're bringing in hydrogen, they're bringing in CO2, and they're making the building blocks of life. And that's powering growth. That's what, you know, that's making one cell become two cells. Um, and it's become clear over the last maybe 10, 15 years or so that this is what cancer cells are doing. Um, that, you know, it, it turned out around about 2007, 2008, um, there, were, there were several mutations discovered in enzymes in the Krebs cycle that nobody ever thought would have anything to do with cancer. Um, but they, they drive cancer. Okay. Um, and so it led to a lot of attention. And, and going back to a thing known as the Warburg effect, which goes back to this probably slightly crazy German biochemist, brilliant biochemist, Nobel laureate uh, from, from the 1931 or thereabouts, but um, who had these ideas on cancer back in the 1920s, 1930s. It's 100 years this year, I think, since his original papers on that. Um, and it's known as the Warburg effect. And effectively, what he, what he talked about was cancer cells revert to a, a simpler phenotype. They stopped doing respiration as we know it, and they just grow. That was effectively what he said. Okay. Um, now, it's a bit more complicated than that. They don't really stop doing respiration, but what they do do is they rewire metabolism, they rewire the Krebs cycle, and they, they gear it, rather than just using it for energy generation, as most of our cells do, they kind of working like those old bacteria do, and they're going in the opposite direction, and they're using it to power growth. Um, and so, you know, it's not exactly clear what you do about that to try and cure cancer, but uh, you know, it's it's a step in the direction of at least understanding what's going wrong in cancer. And it it can, if you rewire metabolism, that will tend to rewire gene activity as well. Um, and 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 so you you know you activate some genes and switch off other genes, and you 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 rewire the information circuits of the cell. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I did want to remind our, our audience that uh, the police, if they have any questions, to go ahead and put those in the uh, Q&A um, before we move forward. 
and mm-hmm. um, and we will move forward. So we were talking about uh, uh, talked about the dark side, and then there's that uh, the chapter the flux capacitor, and of course you know that kind of brings you back to that uh, movie with Michael J. Fox and all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> so um, yes. well, I, I know the name of the movie, but I'm not going to mention it because of the fact I'm not sure if there's any kind of copyright thing, type things. But basically, the, the chapter is called the flux capacitor. And uh, what what uh, <laughs> what do I mean by that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid it's not a, a, a 1960s DeLorean or anything <laughs> like that. Um, it's um, so it's really about mitochondria and aging. That chapter uh, and the the chapter on the dark side, the chapter about cancer um, and this metabolic rewiring. Um, that that can happen that leads to a you know a shift in direction of the Krebs cycle. It starts going the wrong way around and starts powering growth instead of instead of uh, energy generation. Well, the question is why 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 does that happen? Um, and, and one of the biggest risk factors for cancer, but not just for cancer, for effectively all age related diseases, it, it's there in the name. Um, we, you know our, our, our risk of getting a, a disease like cancer goes up about 10, I think it at least doubles every 10 years. So um, I think it's slightly more than that, in fact. So, so from, from the age of about 50 onwards, it's, you know, our, our risk is really, is really increasing very quickly. So cancer is very much an age-related disease, and so is Alzheimer's disease, and so is uh, Parkinson's disease and, 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 and everything else. Um, so the question really is, what is it about aging which is unmasking something, what's changing as we get older. Um, and again, a lot we can understand in terms of what's happening with the Krebs cycle, because if, if, if respiration gets damaged, which is something that Warburg was talking about long ago, but if respiration gets damaged, it doesn't only affect our energy levels, it also affects, affects how, how the Krebs cycle spins. In, instead of spinning in the kind of the forwards direction linked to energy generation, it's at least going to slow down because respiration is effectively burning the NADH, it's burning the hydrogen that's given off from stripping it out of food. Um, and and if, if we can't burn that hydrogen in the normal way, then everything gums up. And when that gums up, um, then the, the Krebs cycle kind of slows down and starts to go off in the opposite direction. And, and that's rewiring metabolism as we get older. And the kind of things that you would expect and predict are the kind of things that, that <laughs> I'm finding myself as uh, I'm in my mid, mid, mid fifties now, um, you know, yes, my energy levels are dropping. Yes. I'm beginning to put on some weight and you begin to realize that you, you've got to eat less. Otherwise <laughs> you're going to get really out of shape. Uh, and it takes longer, you get aches and pains, and I've got a shoulder ache. And, you know, all of these things are, are linked with just getting older. And it's linked with a change in metabolism, and it's linked with a change in the gene activity, which is, which is, which is associated with that change in metabolism. So it's, it's kind of, some people think that this, these changes with aging is a genetic program, um, which is a bit nasty, isn't it? If we're kind of programmed to, to mm-hmm. fall to pieces. Um, yes. You, some people call it a pseudo program. It's not really a program. The interesting thing to me is we can understand it and explain it um, really in terms of damage to respiration. Gradual impairment of respiration leads to a slowing down and a reversal of some bits of metabolism, which leads to a rewiring of, of, of which genes are active and which ones are not, which tends to increase inflammation. Uh, so, you know, we get these aches and pains and, and, and um we, we don't heal in the same way that we used to. We're more uh, likely to susceptible to, to infections and things like that. So, so a lot of this can be explained in quite simple terms. That doesn't mean that's really what happens. It's just it's an explanatory paradigm, um, which is consistent with quite a lot of what we know. It may not be the whole truth, but it's a, it's a, a different way of seeing the question. And, um, and I, I think it's, it's quite a helpful way of seeing the question. I agree. And... Um... For a second there, I thought you read, you'd been reading my diary when you're talking about the aches and the pains and the <laughs> not able to lose weight as fast as uh, you had yeah. been and those types of things. And even though you spend more time in the gym, it's like, okay, well, you know, so no, yeah, but that's uh, more. You gain less. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. And 
having dinner with my sister-in-law last night, she was talking about one of the reasons why she no longer rides horses because of the fact she's afraid if she falls, then it's going to, you know, take her so long to heal. Whereas when she was younger, she could fall off and yes. hey, it wasn't nothing. But, um, but now, now, um, now it makes sense. It does make sense. And uh, cause of course, you know, you've got the rheumatoid arthritis and the other types of items that come in as you get older and you're trying to, trying to determine as to uh, what's causing those, you know, you might've had it for years, but why is it now that it's starting to, why is it flaring up now? Yeah. Yes. yeah they're, they're interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. Has I mean, I don't researched... pretend to answer all of those questions in the book, but uh, what I was trying to do is give a, a, a kind of a sketch of the processes that are behind it. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, it, for something like rheumatoid arthritis, it, it can be just joint damage or an inflammation, a bacterial infection or some kind of infection that, that just triggers it there at, mm -hmm. at that time. Um, sometimes it's an immune problem, an autoimmune problem that the immune system starts to attack your own joints. But why does it do that? What, what is it about those cells that suddenly get so twitchy? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it's uncovered by aging. And then there's a there's specific spike and in the case of cancer, there may be a particular mutation or something that just triggers it. Or it can be, again, some inflammation. That's why smoking will make things worse. Or if your diet's terrible, it's going to make, you know, that's the spike added on to the fact that we're older and we're more susceptible to these things. And you go and poke it and poke it and then something unpleasant happens. Yeah, It's like the perfect storm. You know, yeah, I, I, it yeah. came to mind, you know, when I was reading, it was like the perfect storm. OK, if you know, if you check this box and this box not not checked and check this box and this box not checked, then, of course, that's what the catalyst is in order for something to happen. So, um, yeah, I, like I said, I was, I was reading it and the thing that came to my mind is the perfect storm because it's somebody else could be in the same scenario, same age, same this, same that, and be exposed to the same things as you are, but based on your body's makeup yes. and their body. I mean, that's an interesting thing about, about age. You know, we all, we all age at roughly the same rate, and roughly meaning you know, some, of, some of us might live twice as long as others, but, you know, average life expectancy is 70 to 80, slightly going up still. Um, but, but we all go through basically the same stuff. Um, but then we all get different diseases some some people are going to get cancer some people are going to get alzheimer's some people are going to get rheumatoid arthritis whatever it may be or or all of them if you're really unlucky um so there's this kind of interesting juxtaposition of a really general process with really specific endpoints yes um and and it, it yeah that's that's what i, I was trying to get at uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the, the the biochemistry that underpins it all and, and how how simple can you make it how simply can we understand it and i, I think it's I think it is quite simple. It's just really difficult to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, because quite honestly, when I was reading the book and I knew that we were going to be having this conversation, I was looking at some of the, uh, some of the uh, figures in the book, and I'm like, well, you know, if it came down to it, we could really get deep, 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 and you know, but since this is not a uh, uh, Google Talks, it's not one where we have the ability to draw the figures and so forth. So we have mm -hmm. to be careful as to how deep we go and what, how much we can talk about because we could, you know, lose a number of people. But I think the way in which you've explained <laughs> yes. it, and I think, you know, the, the comparisons to which you've utilized in the book allows an individual with no scientific bag background at all to be able to come in and understand exactly what you're saying based on using well, those examples. Well, I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I can't pretend that it's an easy read. Um, I, I think, I suppose what I, what I, aspire to do is is to be clear and accessible uh, but i don't want to shirk away from trying to explain it so that it's clear why it's that way mm -hmm. I, I hate preaching at people i hate saying take it from me i'm an expert it's like this because you know mm -hmm. people people have got i think you know it's brought to a head with covid people have got really fed up of being preached at by experts um and, and, and it's fair, you know, experts don't know any more, well, they don't know any better than anybody else. They know more than other people, but there's so many things that, you know, you, you kind of know less as you know more. You, you realize all the stuff you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what I try and do is, is give enough detail that anybody who cares and is interested and is willing to put in a bit of effort to stick with it can see for themselves or can argue the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but they can see why I'm saying it's like that. What's the evidence for it? Why, why, why is it this way? Why is it not that way? Um, and it, so it's not a case of just just tell people. It's a case of try and try and help them see for themselves. And it's it's quite exciting. I think that's the other thing about um, about this kind of research is it, it it unveils a different way of seeing the world. 
um, and, and it's right at the edge of what we know and what we don't know. And, and that's what makes science exciting for people. And I think it's, it's what, what can help bring science to life for you know, a wider public who aren't necessarily scientists. And a lot of scientists themselves who work on other areas, um, it just keeps a little bit of that magic that it has for a lot of people who go on to become scientists at the age of 15, 16, as I was, you're really interested in the world. You don't know that much about it. You, you want someone to explain without patronizing you and take yes. you to the edge of what we know. Mm -hmm. No, and I can appreciate that. And, and as, I, as I reference the figures, you know, I looked at the figures and they were readable to me, but also one of the points in which I want to make sure is clear is that the verbiage that goes along with those figures <laughs> gives individuals the opportunity to better understand without feeling like they're being lectured to or, or preached to for lack, lack mm -hmm. of a better term or told what no. to do. The data is there and the science is there. And as we, as you somewhat uh, mentioned in a way, you know, it's up for the individual's own interpretation, but you're giving the information there for folks to, to interpret. So that was a, a great find, a great uh, part of the book. So thank you for that. Great. Thank so, you. um, I know you somewhat might have already uh, talked about this, but what are, if it came down to it, what are the key takeaways? Um, of course, a lot of commitment has to be made when one decides to write a book. So you decide to write a book and um, what is the, what was your vision when you wrote this book? What were you hoping for folks to be able to come away from reading the book with? Um. I love the idea of being able to explain things in principle from the bottom up. Um, why is life this way? Why is the world this way? You know, what science does is is provide you know laws, I suppose, the laws of physics, whatever it may be, that um, seem very abstruse but have huge explanatory power behind them. And biology is kind of notorious for not really having any rules, right? Biology is a load of exceptions. And there, there are very few rules. And those that are are kind of flexible rules like natural selection that you can bend, <laughs> bend the rules with natural selection in all kinds of different ways. Um, and I think, I, I suppose I've thought, you know, I did biochemistry at university, but I wanted to do biochemistry because I'd, I read a book by Stephen Rose called The Chemistry of Life. Um, and it, I love chemistry and I love biology and I didn't know what biochemistry was, but this was the, this was the chemistry of life. And it was thrilling to me that, that biochemistry is basically the same in all cells. There's some, it, this is unifying across all of life. And I find this is quite beautiful to, to understand that the bacteria that might kill you, actually, their biochemistry is the same. It works in the same way. There's a kind of a Lion King <laughs> logic to it that, you know, the circle of life is this, it's, a ra it's, it's rather beautiful that we have so much in common with all the rest of life out there, however nasty it might be, in our basic underlying biochemistry. And is that, that begs this question, why? Why is biochemistry that way rather than it could be any other way? And, and, and then you get into these more fundamental questions about, well, is this chemistry of life the only kind of chemistry that could give rise to life? Um, so why, why is it this way rather than some other way? Because the only way really, you know, we can't imagine what life might be like somewhere else, but, but if we want to know, um, why is it this way here? That begins, if we can deconstruct that, then it begins to tell us, well, carbon really is important for these reasons. And maybe you can get around it here, but, you know, I could imagine we find life somewhere else in the universe. If it's going to be made of silicon or something chances are someone made it because it's really difficult to build from sand uh, as a kind of bottom-up process but from carbon carbon dioxide it's a kind of like a lego brick you can build with lego bricks you, you just pluck it out of the atmosphere and stick it onto the end of something and so you begin to understand how how things are built and all that boils down to in the end is is kind of the chemistry of carbon dioxide um and, and it sounds stupid, but there's a lot of it that we don't really know very well. But mm -hmm. if you look at the bonds in carbon dioxide and then the simple molecules that you make from it, the simple organic molecules, and you think about the chemistry of it, you begin to say, okay, well, this 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 is going to react. This <laughs> this bond is unstable. It's going to react. And so yes. what's it going to react with? Well, it's going to react with this. And, and you realize that you can begin to build up what the chemistry of life looks at, like from from just starting 
if you like, from, I'd like to say from the right place, not everyone would agree with that statement, but uh, start, starting with CO2 and hydrogen, you kind of get biochemistry as we see it. You get the Krebs cycle, you get uh, these processes of growth, and then in the presence of oxygen, you get the processes of aging as well. And so you can almost explain all of the origin and evolution of life and why we age and why the sex and all of these kind of questions <laughs> Sounds amazingly stupid, but almost from the chemistry of carbon dioxide. Um, and I, I think it's an amazing power of science that you're, you're, you're able to abstract it in that way and, and, and understand so much from what really in the end is quite simple chemistry. Okay. All right. Um, I know we've got uh, 10 minutes left here. So, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and I think we've got a question that I want to go ahead and see if uh, we can um, get an opportunity to read that. Um, we've got uh, Farah Nesbitt, um, and it's uh, thank you for joining us today. What is the most surprising discovery um, when writing the book? Hmm. Um, well, one thing we we didn't touch on uh, was the the epilogue of the book, which um, I think that was probably the most surprising discovery. Um, it, it's it's um it's it's something that I've become quite interesting in, but but interested in. But xenon um, is is an inert gas, and it's a general anaesthetic, um, and it turns out that um, it influences the reason it's a general anaesthetic. Nobody really knows how general anaesthetics work, but it interferes with respiration, okay. and that might well be one of the reasons why anaesthetics work the way that they do. And so it brings it into this same process of, of burning hydrogen in oxygen, of respiration of the Krebs cycle and so on, uh, and the fundamental chemistry of life. And, and, and anaesthetics are about the, the only way that we can get at consciousness as well in terms of, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a reversible switch, switching it on and off. Um, and so it's another big theme in biology and in life is what on earth is consciousness and how does it work? And anesthetics are a way of getting at that. And the fact that an inert gas, which is kind of not going to be a hand in glove mechanism in a, re in a receptor or an enzyme or something like that, uh, is beginning to say there's something else going on. And so, so that was a discovery for me. Um, it, it, it was it, it sort of work from Luca Turin. Um, but but I also touched on work from Mike Levin, um, who who's been doing amazing work on 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 um, on effectively voltage maps during development. That you can more or less map which bit's going to become the head, which bit's going to become an eye, which bit is going to be a tail, uh, whatever it may be, uh, or, or which bit is 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 going to become a cancer um, okay. from 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 the voltage of these things. And, and a lot of what, uh, you know, respiration is about voltage really as well. And so it, 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 it begins to, and a lot of the stuff on the origin of life also in a hydrothermal vent is, is about the voltage across the vent, which is driving this reaction between hydrogen and CO2 to make Krebs cycle intermediates. So um, electrical charge and voltage and, 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 and how cells work and how anesthetics work and how consciousness might work that's been a thrilling discovery that maybe some of the some of the chemistry I'm interested in might be relevant to these processes, and that's uh, that's great fun to think about. So, yeah, the the, the discovery that uh, that xenon this is not, not this is my dis this is a discovery for me. It's mm -hmm. been known for a long time. Uh, it just was new to me. Um, can interfere with respiration is is thrilling. Wow. Okay, so. Um... I don't see any other questions out there, but uh, I'm going to ask. I'm going to follow up. What's next? Is, uh, <laughs> is that recent discovery? Is that what's next for you, or what's next? Um, well, I have a lab here at, uh, at UCL, and where uh, most of the lab is working on the origin of life. There's a, a couple of people who really just started working on anesthetics and how they work recently. Um, my next book will be on the origin of life. I've not uh, I've not got very far with it yet. Um, but we've been having a lot of fun um, trying to understand the emergence of genes and genetic information in this context of we, we've got a metabolism. How, how does information emerge from that? 
Um, and I feel like we, we, we're, we're, we've been having a lot of fun. Uh, we've just got some experimental work that seems to be consistent. Um, and, and so nobody really, certainly not recently, has tried to write a book that just starts with with the simplest prebiotic chemistry and ends up with genes and molecular machines and cells and does every step in the way. And there's, you know, there's some steps missing that we don't really know yet. Um, but that's the ambition is, a, is the big picture behind how we think life or how some of us think life might have started. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, Nick, it's been a pleasure. Um, been a pleasure uh, speaking with you. And, um, and I look forward to that next book. Look forward to the next book. I think, uh, as you said, if that really is uh, one of the keys to uh, anesthetics, I guess it really is going to be a, um, an eye opener for a number of us. And, you know, just uh, thinking about back to our, through our conversation here, it's just like some of the examples you use, especially the Lego example. That's why I enjoyed reading your book, because of the fact you do put it in a language in which everyone can understand. Um, and uh, what made it a, a great read for me. So um, if you don't have anything else, I will go ahead and I will say thank you for your time. Thank no, you for joining us pleasure. here on Talks at Google. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take thank care. you very much. It's been a pleasure.